It's hard to believe that after 20 years, the Final Fantasy VII Remake is finally out. And you know what? Part of me still doesn't believe it, considering that rumors of a Final Fantasy VII Remaster had been discussed since all the way back in 2005. At that time, Square Enix released a Final Fantasy VII PlayStation 3 tech demo, and everyone was thinking that a remake was in the works. It also didn't help that they released a ton of content for 7 as well. There was Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, the CG movie sequel. They released a Japanese mobile exclusive prequel before Crisis. Also, there was, in my opinion at least, the wholly overlooked and underappreciated retelling of Zack Fair's story in Crisis Core, plus an animated feature with Last Order. Then there was whatever their just Cerebus was supposed to be, which don't get me wrong, I think that game has its charm, but kind of felt like it was just added there and they had a weird secret ending. And anyway, it seems like if there was ever going to be a remake or a remaster, it would have been around then. But it never happened. We got rumors, denials, teases, more denials, false starts, and then even more denials for 15 years. It was dragged on so long, I never expected the remake to happen. Yet, here we are. This video isn't about the remake. Admittedly, I haven't played it yet. I'm in the camp of waiting for the whole game to be released before I dive into it. I'm looking forward to it, but I'll be the first to admit that I'm a bit nervous about how much they changed. I know that the combat moved from the turn-based active time battle system to a more action-oriented combat system. I know they added some new characters and scenes not in the original, and I've been told I sound like Wedge. You guys are the worst! I don't know, but if I do, there you go, you probably can't unhear it now. However, those are the changes I can live with. But there's one thing in particular that disappointed me. Something so completely vital to the experience that I can't believe that Square Enix would flagrantly rewrite history. I just find it unfathomable, perhaps even insulting, that they would release the Final Fantasy VII Remake demo standalone and not include it in a remake of Tobol No. 1. Well before Final Fantasy VII hit store shelves in 1997, Tobol No. 1 gave players the chance to experience 8 months prior thanks to the included Square Sampler, Square's first demo disc for the Sony PlayStation. It featured a playable demo of Final Fantasy VII, as well as video previews of Final Fantasy Tactics, Bushido Blade, and Saga Frontier. Whereas the demo disc is now a piece of video game history, Tobol No. 1 remained relatively obscure. Tobol wasn't developed by Square, but instead they only published it. The developer was a small company known as Dream Factory Limited, Tobol No. 1 being their first game. By virtue of publishing, Square decided to include the demo disc in order to promote their upcoming projects for the Sony PlayStation. However, due to the hype and subsequent massive success of Final Fantasy VII, Tobol No. 1 ultimately ended up with the reputation as the one game that came with the Final Fantasy VII demo. In a way, it would set the tone for the rest of Dream Factory's history. Their company had the potential to be one of the biggest developers in the late 90s. Their games were competently made, unique, and entirely memorable experiences to those that played them, each one achieving the status of a cult classic. But for one reason or another, Dream Factory never managed to achieve the success they deserved. Which is a shame because behind this small company is a huge origin story. One that covers the earliest era of 3D fighters and might even hold the secret to the greatest betrayal in video game history. So to celebrate the success of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, I think now is the perfect opportunity to shine light on the games that have been stuck in its shadow. This is Design Documentaries, an in-depth look at a game's history, design, and legacy. And today we're taking a look at Tobol No. 1 and the life and death of Dream Factory. Released in Japan on August 2nd, 1996, Tobol No. 1 was one of the earliest 3D fighting games on the Sony PlayStation, alongside Namco's Tekken and Tamsoft's Battle Arena Toshiden. 
It was the first game released by Dream Factory and was also the first game published by Square for the Sony PlayStation. That in itself is interesting for a few reasons, but we're going to get back to that in a bit. Upon release, Tobal was a pretty big success in Japan, selling nearly 700,000 units in its first year to become the ninth best-selling game of 1996. That was the same year that Resident Evil and Super Mario 64 hit store shelves. It even managed to outsell Enix's Dragon Quest VI. I mean, granted, Dragon Quest VI was released in December 1995 and sold 2.5 million copies in that one month alone, but still, not bad for Tobol, all things considered. That success wasn't undeserved either. Critics were highly impressed by the game's visuals especially, which, listen, I know, it does not look like much compared to other games even at that time. Backgrounds are bland, characters seem to be missing textures. It definitely looks different, but not particularly impressive. Remember though, this was the early era of the PlayStation and the start of the era of 3D gaming. And, well, companies were still trying to figure out how to handle polygons. While the PlayStation was undoubtedly impressive for the time, it was still pushing the limits of what technology could do. While many games used fog or short draw distance, and some clever games like Resident Evil figured out how to use pre-rendered backgrounds, for the most part games just had to sacrifice fidelity for playability. Tobo number 1 from a technical standpoint was impressive. It's hard to appreciate it as much now considering the technology had surpassed it fairly quickly as other developers figured out the in and outs of the hardware. But to really appreciate it, you have to look at it from the lens it was made. Tobal ran at 480 interlaced with a consistent 60 frames per second when most games were limited to 240 and whatever frames they could hope for. I mean, compare a contemporary like Battle Arena to Shiden 3 and how those games would have looked or more importantly ran in that era. And you can see the difference is pretty noticeable. Tobal manages this by using a technique called garage shading. Basically, it's simply using a color grading on each of the faces of a polygon that make up a model in order to color a polygon while not having a clear divide like you would have with flat shading. Not only does this make 3D models look smoother, but in the case of Tobal, it didn't require the PlayStation to render textures placed on the polygons, which was already fairly notorious for shimmering pixels. This also meant more processing power was available for smoother frame rates and providing an overall crisper look. It was fairly common to see garage shading back in the day. It was used in games like Super Mario 64 and Square's own Final Fantasy 7, and it's still being used occasionally in the modern era, like with Street Fighter 4. Beyond just the graphics, Tobal was pretty unique in the fact that it was almost like two different games in one. Beyond the main fighting mode, it also featured what was called a quest mode, where you basically went through a dungeon, avoiding traps, fighting enemies, finding keys, and unlocking doors until you got to the end. It was very rudimentary, using the same combat system as in the main game, but now in a basic 3D dungeon, which is, well, pretty awkward honestly. It's far from ideal and the dungeon mode itself isn't too great, but come on, how many other fighting games featured a dungeon mode? No, not yet, we're not talking about that yet. The game also features an amazing soundtrack from some of Square's best composers. Yoko Shimomura, who is most famous for her work in Street Fighter 2 and Super Mario RPG, which, yeah, I know, I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's gonna happen, don't worry. Kenji Ito, who worked with Square on the Saga series, Yasunori Mitsuda, who worked on Chrono Trigger and later Xenogears, and Ryoji Sasai, who had an incredible resume from Final Fantasy Mystic Quest alone. And hearing what Squaresoft could pull off once they had access to CD quality music was nothing short of mind blowing. But what makes Tobal Number 1 stand out the most is the character designs made by none other than Akira Toriyama. At the time, he was responsible for two of the biggest pop cultural products in Japan, namely Dragon Quest and Dragon Ball Z. He also did some work with Square earlier with the character designs for Chrono Trigger, 
Famous for its distinctive style, the models are easily recognizable despite the lack of textures, and even Toriyama himself makes an appearance. Kinda. The characters themselves fall under the same tropes as you would expect in a fighting game. You have the all-rounder character, the fast but weak character, the slow but strong character, the old guy, the weird alien, the other all-rounder character with blonde hair this time. Though it is nice to see a female take the role of the grappler for once. Mary is definitely Bay. As far as the actual fighting goes, Tobel was... Alright. Combat consisted of high, mid, low attacks. There is a pretty intuitive combo system, as well as a fairly complex grappling system. Jumping and crouching were done with the L and R buttons, with up and down instead being used to move towards and away from the camera. And it featured this quite a while before Soul Calibur would popularize it. However, there really wasn't anything about Tobol that changed the face of 3D fighting games. There were no particular gimmicks, no genre-shattering evolution to the mechanics. It was just a solid, playable, and fairly competitive fighting game. You could say there was nothing offensive about it. If anything, it felt particularly close to the designs of other fighting games, like Virtual Fighter or Tekken. Which, there is a good reason for that. Because it was made by the same person who made Virtual Fighter and Tekken, one Siichi Ishii. While many attribute the creation of Virtual Fighter to Yu Suzuki, the famed designer who was behind Sega's AM2 division which created Space Harrier, hang on and would later become known for Shenmue. Sega's venture into polygons was actually a joint effort between Mr. Suzuki and Seiichi Ishii. However, while Yu Suzuki eventually became known as Sega Shigeru Miyamoto, history seems to have forgotten about Seiichi Ishii. Ishii's story starts like many other early game developers. He had been interested in video games ever since he first stumbled upon a Space Invaders cabinet, and later decided he didn't just want to play video games, but design them. However, back then there wasn't a traditional game design degree, so Ishii found himself going to school for 3D design, color composition, and modeling, a path that ultimately led him to his job at Sega with the AM2 division. And that was around the same time where games were just starting to experiment with fully 3D graphics, and every company was trying to make the push into polygons. Sega was especially invested. They were on the losing side of a console war with Nintendo, and were looking for any advantage they could get. But because 3D was still new, Ishii was the only person who had any experience with 3D graphics. Despite him being new to Sega, he was able to work directly with Yu Suzuki with their first fully 3D game, Virtua Racing. According to co-workers, despite his inexperience, Ishii was pretty brilliant at his job. He was able to come up with solutions to get the most out of the limited hardware, and he was a pretty quick worker as well. Unlike Yu Suzuki, he wasn't really passionate about racing though. Instead, during the downtime, he was thinking about how he would make a fighting game. He was inspired by Toriyama's Dragon Ball series, Jackie Chan movies, the manga Kenji, and by his father who was into karate. He was also a fan of Capcom Street Fighter 2, but he had some issues with the design. When I was playing a fighting game at the time, I was dissatisfied. And when I lost, I couldn't understand why I was killed. Even if you fight with intuition, you lose. The only way to win is to learn the game. Of course, learning is one of the pleasures of the game, but I may not be satisfied with the balance between intuition and reflexes. So while working on virtual racing, in his downtime he would create models for fighting game characters, and then started animating them with attacks from movies and manga he saw, slowly putting together characters with a variety of punches, kicks, and fighting styles. Other staff members started to take notice of his impressive work that he was managing in his spare time and the timing couldn't have been better. Sega was struggling to get a foothold in the fighting game genre because, well, let's face it, Dark Edge and Burning Rivals weren't exactly selling that great, so pioneering the first 3D fighting game was exactly what Sega was hoping for to sell units. Seiichi was given the chance to make a proof of concept prototype and that was ultimately greenlit, with Yu Suzuki leaving the design and development in Ichi's hands. So really, Seiichi Ishii himself was the sole father of the 3D fighting game. The game he would go on to make would be known as Virtua Fighter. Arguably, if just for a moment had kept Sega afloat, and its success was the next big evolution in the genre. Though it wasn't exactly enough to save Sega from its other 
poor decisions. In 1994, Sega was struggling with their disastrous 32X launch and their shaky start with the Saturn. Namco had managed to poach a lot of developers who were looking for a bit more job security, Ishii included. With the experienced developers from Virtua Fighter, Namco had tried their own hand in the fighting game genre with Tekken. Seiichi Ishii was the lead for both Tekken and Tekken 2, and both of them were major successes for Namco each selling over a million copies and winning multiple awards. He was well on his way to becoming a huge name in gaming, and might have been content to stay at Namco. But this is where Squaresoft comes in, and where the story gets really interesting. Around this time, Squaresoft was embroiled in their own controversy. The company having abandoned their long-standing relationship with Nintendo to make games exclusively for Sony. This surprising breakout came after their relationship seemed the strongest. Squaresoft had been a second party developer for Nintendo for almost their entire existence, and the relationship eventually led them to co-develop a game alongside Nintendo with one of their biggest IPs, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. During that development, Nintendo had also announced the Ultra 64, the successor to the Super Nintendo. Square, eager to see what the next-gen Final Fantasy might have looked like, created the Final Fantasy VI interactive CG game demo. You know, the one that was often confused for being a beta of Final Fantasy VII. The tech demo was pretty impressive for the era, but by the time the dev kits for the Nintendo 64 and the specs would be finalized, along with Nintendo's decision to stick with the cartridge format, it was clear that the hardware wouldn't come anywhere close to fulfilling the vision that Square had had. Instead, they would decide to develop for Nintendo's competitor, the Sony PlayStation. It was a shock, not only to fans, but supposedly to the staff at Square as well. According to Hiroshi Kawai, who was a character programmer working at Square, there was just a casual announcement of, oh, just so you know, we're not developing for Nintendo anymore. There are different accounts of what happened behind the scenes, ranging anywhere from Nintendo being disappointed but not holding any ill feelings towards Square, to the breakup going so bad with Nintendo that supposedly Nintendo told Squaresoft to never come back. It's easier to believe the latter, as Final Fantasy VII's ad campaign took some pretty big shots at Nintendo, and Square not releasing a game for a Nintendo console for six years. I mean, we're just only now seeing Final Fantasy VII on a Nintendo console. In a cartridge format too, ironically. So what does any of this have to do with Tobo No. 1 and Dream Factory? Well, in a way, it paints a different story altogether. Dream Factory didn't come into existence because Saichi Ishii decided to go on his own, and just so happened to stumble into a contract with Squaresoft. The reality was, Square founded Dream Factory, offering Saichi Ishii his own game development studio and publishing deal. The company was officially founded in November 1995, which was only a month after the Nintendo 64 dev kits started getting into developers' hands. Okay, that's suspicious, but not exactly damning. Square could have been considering moving to the PlayStation before the final specs were released, and even if not, nothing was stopping Dream Factory from designing games for the Nintendo 64. What's more suspicious is the circumstances surrounding how Dream Factory was founded. Forgive the obvious statement, but 1995 wasn't a post-Final Fantasy VII world. RPGs were popular in Japan, but still often sold poorly in the West. While Square wasn't by any means struggling, starting an independent studio isn't cheap, especially when you're bringing in one of the biggest names in 3D development and fighting games, alongside a team to complement that, not to mention Ikari Toriyama. The timing also came when Square's next big project would break records for being the world's most expensive game to develop, nearly $150 million if you include the game's marketing budget. This was back then when the average PlayStation 1 game cost less than a million to make. So where exactly did Square even get that cash? A lot of that might have come from investments. Square became public in the Japanese stock market in 1994. Dream Factory, though, was unique. While according to Next Generation Magazine, Square itself didn't put up the funds, but rather it was a major Square stockholder who was investing money outside of the stocks specifically for the founding of Dream Factory and hiring Ishii. 
Who was this unnamed investor? Unfortunately for that, I wasn't able to find an answer. That information most likely never made public. It does seem rather suspicious though. I mean, someone offering Square money to bring aboard the biggest name in 3D development at the time, when Squaresoft was still considering shifting loyalties during the console war. A war, mind you, that Sony was heavily invested in winning after being scorned in their own relationship with Nintendo. Someone who stood a lot to gain for not only winning one of the biggest RPG developers, but also would be able to use said acquisition to launch a highly effective ad campaign against Nintendo. Is it possible that Square's departure wasn't as sudden as everyone thought? Yes. Could Sony have potentially offered Squaresoft a huge financial incentive so they would move to PlayStation development? Absolutely. Was Dream Factory the icing on the proverbial cake? A welcoming gift from Sony to what would be the PlayStation's biggest boon? It's entirely possible. Could history have repeated itself with the Final Fantasy VII Remake? Totally. Could all of this evidence just be a crazy coincidence and conspiracy theory? Yeah, probably. Unfortunately, due to the secretive nature of company politics, and considering this was over 25 years ago, it's likely that the full story of what happened between Square and Nintendo will remain a mystery. I'm not here to clickbait with the hidden truth or anything. I'm just here pointing out some things you might not have known before. The circumstantial evidence behind Tobol just offers another potential lens to look through. But that does bring into question. If Dream Factory wasn't part of some secret deal to get Square on board, then why was Dream Factory founded? Why not just hire Ishii directly? Pragmatically speaking, Squaresoft was likely all hands on deck for Final Fantasy VII while trying to get Super Mario RPG on the shelves. The company simply couldn't handle another project. Creating an auxiliary development studio would have allowed them to work on other projects as a publisher. It was probably also a better way to simply get Ishii to move from Namco. I mean, being a designer is pretty great, and really the only way up from there is moving to your own studio. Square could have wanted him because not only was he an experienced developer, but they were also trying to get a feel for PlayStation development. Not to mention it was their first time working with Sony as well. It makes sense wanting to learn the development and production process from not only someone who is already familiar with both, but it's also better to learn that process with a smaller title before releasing what would be their biggest title so far. It might not even be that improbable to say that Tobal was simply meant to sell people on Final Fantasy VII from the outset. Tobal released alongside a massive $100 million marketing effort for Final Fantasy VII, which included commercials, magazine covers, the infamous ads against Nintendo, among plenty of other things. The included demo disc was a good way to get the final product into players' hands. It probably wasn't even an accident that they brought in Akira Toriyama to do the character design. The same person who is famous for Enix's Dragon Quest. It was a good way to get their competitor's player base to take notice. Tobol number 1 could have seriously been published just to be the game that came with the Final Fantasy VII demo. That's rather dismissive though. The fact was at the time Final Fantasy VII was a huge gamble. RPGs were not popular in the West, and the PlayStation didn't have a massive install base by the time Final Fantasy VII was in development. It's a bit surreal to imagine, but think of a world where Final Fantasy VII would have just sold okay-ish. There might not have been a massive boom in RPGs after that, and that could have easily happened. Square was likely diversifying their portfolio in the hopes to find other successes, just in case that was the reality. Hiring the father of 3D fighting games was probably their best attempt to take on the popular fighting genre, much like Sega and Namco before them. You could make the argument that Tobol wasn't even selling Final Fantasy VII, but rather, Square could have been hoping that the demo would get Tobol No. 1 into more people's hands. Speaking of the demo, even though Final Fantasy VII was front and center, they were still hedging their bets with other games and genres. Lightweight's Bushido Blade was a non-standard fighter, 
Final Fantasy Tactics was in development by Yasumi Matsuno, the man behind the Ogre Battle series which Square had also acquired. There is also Saga Frontier, which would also likely pick up sales from their more traditional RPG fanbase. And while not on the demo disc, Einander was also in development around this time as well. And that was a shmup, which was far from Square's wheelhouse. I imagine if Final Fantasy VII didn't meet the same success, we would have seen a car combat game from Square. That's not the reality we live in, though. Final Fantasy VII saw a massive success that would not only create the RPG boom in the West, but ultimately define what RPGs would be to this very day. Tobol, on the other hand, wouldn't redefine the fighting game. Despite all its strengths, it simply didn't have enough momentum behind it to make much of an impact in comparison to Virtual Fighter or Tekken. While sales in Japan were good, in the West it was a different story, selling just over 100,000 units. In a bit of irony, it was the hype of Final Fantasy VII and the launch of the Nintendo 64 that overshadowed Tobol's release. Akira Toriyama's name and artwork probably didn't motivate any sales either. Considering Dragon Warrior's lack of popularity, and because Dragon Ball Z wouldn't appear in syndication in America for a couple of months yet. But the biggest downfall was Tobol's competition, which unfortunately was Tekken 2, a game that CG himself was responsible for. Tobol number 1 was successful enough in Japan though to warrant a second round, this time just called Tobol 2 and not Tobol number 2. Released in Japan in April of 1997, with Squaresoft behind publishing again, Tobol 2 was an improvement in every single way over its predecessor. The game did not only look better while still keeping the animation resolution of the original, but the gameplay improved as well. The roster increased from the original's 12 characters to 200. I'm not even kidding, this game has 200 playable fighters, and this predated Mugen by two years. Now, granted, most of these were clones with just slightly alternate stats, but still, 200 characters. These additional characters were unlocked by the game's expanded quest mode, which by now is practically its own game. Featuring procedurally generated dungeons, connected by a hub world, and featuring a leveling system where you increase your stats of your limbs by using them. You can even bring your leveled up character into versus mode and fight your trained character against your friends. Tobol 2 was also probably the most technically impressive game on the PlayStation. According to Ken Kutaragi, the CEO of Sony of America at the time, whereas most games were able to utilize roughly 50% of the PlayStation's potential, Tobol was estimated to be pulling around 90%, according to an algorithm that Sony had used. By all rights, Tobol 2 was a much improved game over the original, and Square could have given it the push needed to go toe to toe with Namco's Tekken 3. Except, they didn't. Whereas Tobol No. 1 got front cover magazine treatment with plenty of print ads, it was mostly a silent release for Tobol 2, resulting in fewer sales in Japan. By the time it came to localize it for Western audiences, Square decided it simply wasn't worth it, citing the original's disappointing sales. Supposedly, the reason was given because Square had a contract with Sony to release five games in the West, but their localization team was deep into getting Final Fantasy VII ready for its American September 6 release date. Instead of going with the text-heavy game like Tobol 2 and its quest mode, they instead chose Einhande. It's sad in a way, but the very same game that Tobol No. 1 would help push would be the reason that Tobol 2 never had a chance in the States. It was probably that event that heavily influenced Dream Factory's next decision. Saichi Ishii's company would get one last attempt on the PlayStation. In December of 1998, Dream Factory would release Air Guys, God Bless the Ring. It was definitely a departure from Tobol, models finally had textures for example. It played less like your traditional 3D fighter that Ishii founded, and more like a precursor to Power Stone. Actually a lot like Power Stone. <laughs> However, Air Guys is close enough in gameplay with its spiritual predecessor that it might as well be called Tobol number 3. 
It had a similar combat system, and the game featured a quest mode that was incredibly in-depth with a bunch of features, including a 50-level procedurally generated dungeon, a variety of weapons, upgrades, magic, a full stat system that changed depending on your diet. Whereas Tobal Number 1's quest mode was an interesting concept, and Tobal 2 made it a more playable experience, the quest mode of Air Guys is probably the best part of the game. Air Guys also had some multiplayer minigames on top of all that. It was a surprisingly varied experience, almost like a party game, standing in contrast to all the serious fighters that were out around that time. But obviously, the big standout for Air Guys is the fact that it features several characters from Final Fantasy VII's roster. Cloud, Sephiroth, Vincent, Tifa, Yuffie, and my personal favorite character, Zack, all make an appearance. There is absolutely no doubt that this was the biggest selling point of the game. Despite the lack of marketing from Square, people were wondering why Cloud was on the cover of this game that continued Square's weird fetish with German naming conventions. It was the first time ever you could play as your favorite Final Fantasy VII character in a fighting game. You could finally punch Cloud right in the materia, or defeat Sephiroth. Not in an epic final confrontation, but simply who is better at diving for a beach flag. This all, unfortunately, seemed to work against Dream Factory. Whereas Topol No. 1 got the reputation of the fighting game that came with the Final Fantasy VII demo, the legacy of Air Guys was the fighting game that had the Final Fantasy VII characters in it for some reason. The tie-in wasn't enough to sell the concept to others, receiving middling reviews from critics who didn't care for the deviation of the standard fighter. It sold modestly about 300,000 copies in Japan and less in the West. Which is a shame because Air Guys, while definitely flawed and highly gimmicky, was not a bad fighting game. It's hardly competitive, but the novelty and gameplay made for a great casual experience with friends. Also, the game's quest mode? I'm serious, it's really good. I'm genuinely confused why Ishii focused exclusively on fighters when he was so good with dungeon crawlers. No, I'm not talking about that yet. It seems strange that the father of Virtua Fighter and Tekken, two of the biggest fighting franchises, would struggle to gain any foothold in the genre he gave birth to. But that wasn't Ishii's goal to begin with. Dream Factory wasn't setting out to create the next big fighting game. Seiichi felt that the technology available at the time, 3D fighting games were still at a major disadvantage compared to the 2D ones. I feel that the 3D genre is still growing and changing, and there is, so far, no zenith in the fighting game realm. Ishii was simply throwing different designs at the wall and seeing what stuck. Even the inclusion of the series' quest modes was an attempt to give console players more value in a solo experience, because it lacked the random competitive nature of the arcades. Dream Factory wasn't about being the pinnacle of evolution, nor did they want to stagnate in the safety of iteration. Instead, the company chose the more risky prospect of innovation. That design philosophy would be evident when Dream Factory was leading the charge for Square once again with the PlayStation 2. In a twist, it wouldn't be a fighting game, despite many initial rumors calling it Air Guys 2. Instead, the bouncer was a 3D beat-em-up and an incredibly ambitious one at that. Beat-em-ups were a genre that thrived in 2D but had struggled in the transition of three dimensions. Seiichi had attempted to bring it into the modern era by including character upgrades, a longer story-based driven experience featuring a interesting narrative that had branching paths and sections that changed up the gameplay. It also had a versus mode, though it didn't feature co-op. And as is Dream Factory tradition, the game was incredibly good-looking and is still one of the better games, at least graphically, for the PS2, despite it effectively being a launch title. But as is also Dream Factory tradition, critics weren't so impressed. Despite the additions, the gameplay still struggled with all the other issues 3D beat-em-ups had faced. Poor camera control, the awkward combat that couldn't sustain itself with longer playthroughs, the lack of a cooperative mode when it was considered standard, all this led to middling reviews saying it was good, but not great. It sold a humble 350,000 units, which was impressive for a launch title, but not nearly enough to warrant a sequel in Squaresoft's eyes. 
It was probably for that reason Dream Factory ended up separating from Squaresoft. And perhaps that's the reason why Microsoft brought them in for the launch of the original Xbox. Changing their name to Dream Publishing in a partnership with Microsoft, they were working on a tech demo called Project KX. It was originally only meant to show the graphical capabilities of Microsoft's new console, which was by all rights Dream Factory's specialty. But Microsoft was so impressed by it, and probably due to a lack of exclusives, they greenlit it as an official game. The project ended up as a fighting game given the name Kakuto Jojin Back Alley Brutal. It played very similar to Tobal with its high mid low style and focus on 3D movement. It was effectively Tobal number 3, well 4, more closely related to Tobal through the gameplay than Air Guys was, sadly though, no quest mode. Kakuto Chojin tried to evolve the genre by giving each character two fighting styles, initially starting with Kakuto and unlocking Chojin after beating the game's story mode. It also featured a four-player battle royale mode as well, likely to show off the Xbox's multiplayer functionality. But of course, critics weren't impressed, some even calling it a Tekken ripoff, probably not even aware of the irony of that statement. Total sales were never reported, but that's probably not as good of a metric in this case. The game ended up being pulled off of store shelves only after a few months of its release. In a situation similar to what happened with Nintendo's Ocarina of Time, one of the characters' background themes featured a religious Arabic chant that was considered highly offensive to those of Islamic beliefs. Allegedly, Microsoft was aware of this before the game was shipped, but due to a misunderstanding or simply negligence, they released the game anyway, only having to recall the game later. Despite promising a re-release, one never came, and old versions were still being found in shipments and store shelves. It's difficult to say what kind of rift this would cause between Microsoft and Dream Publishing, but it was the only project they would work on together. Dream Publishing would change their name back to Dream Factory, and it would signal their move back to PlayStation 2. But not before they made a few UFC licensed games for the Xbox. A strange move considering that Dream Factory almost exclusively worked with their own intellectual property. And this might have been an early sign that things weren't going all that well for the developer. The next game Dream Factory would develop would be in cooperation with Spike, both developers working on the Capcom published title Crimson Tears. Released in 2004, Crimson Tears was basically the quintessential Dream Factory game. The best way to describe it is imagine they took Air Guys' quest mode and just made a full game out of it. Like really, from the procedurally generated levels to having to send one character after another if they happen to fall in battle. It pulls a lot of mechanics from the Forsaken dungeon. In addition, there's a lot of weapon customization and an interesting exhaustion mechanic where your characters overheat. The heavier attack you use, the more it causes heat to build up. And when the gauge is full, you deal even more damage at the cost of your health. There is also a little bit of the bouncer in there, and even a Dark Cloud inspired mechanic where you use your found funds to fix the foundation of the Feld Fortress for fine fortunes. Personally, I love it. I can't believe I didn't know this game existed until I started working on this video. It's by no means an amazing game, but it was the game I had always wanted from Dream Factory. And it feels like a Dream Factory title. Those sort of awkward yet endearing concepts, solid execution, a quirky but charming narrative, and a decent amount of polish. Though, not as much as they had with other titles. You can really see that Dream Factory might have not had the budget of time or money they were used to working with. But as the pattern goes, critics were less than impressed, and Crimson Tears didn't sell well. Capcom also didn't heavily promote it either, basically running one print ad and nothing else. Except Japan got figures of the characters, and I have no idea why that was on Capcom's list of priorities, but all I know is that I want them. Unironically. I guess it's understandable, considering that Crimson Tears was effectively a budget title, but when you consider Dream Factory's pedigree, it's an unnerving shift. The company was once a herald for companies and consoles, and now they were making Simple DS Series Volume 16, the Saga Sao Fushigi Nakonchu no Mori, which is basically a budget RPG that was about insects. Things didn't get much better for Dream Factory and other areas of production either. There was a brief period where they moved from games to anime, providing studios with CG animation. 
In 2001, they worked with Zebek to release Zoid's New Century, which despite middling reviews was actually pretty popular in the West due to its localization featured on Toonami. Dream Factory also helped with the 2004 remake of Appleseed, one that was praised for its visual fidelity, but by no fault of Dream Factory, the movie reviewed poorly and didn't do well in sales. But it would open the door for Seichi Ishii to once again return to Sega, just not for Virtual Fighter. Sega had licensed the rights to release an Appleseed game and brought on Dream Factory to develop it. But like the anime was based on, it was met with indifference from both critics and consumers. And the lack of popularity of the anime in the West meant no US release either. The apparent curse would continue to follow him throughout the years. Dream Factory would team up with Sammy, the creators of Guilty Gear, in order to create a fighting game called Kenju. The game made it to a test market, but didn't do well enough for them to even consider a nationwide release. There was Yoshi Suneki, a game that Dream Factory developed for Ban Presto, but it met with a practically silent release and was overshadowed by a version previously released by From Software. Seiichi Ishii would even return to Namco, but not with Tekken. Instead, the development team worked on a fighting game based on fighting beauty with Long, basically Namco's attempt at a manga based Dead or Alive. It was reviewed pretty harshly by Famitsu and never released outside of Japan. Dream Factory at this point was just floundering, now creating licensed budget titles for the Nintendo DS. However, big news would come in 2008 for Dream Factory. They would once again rejoin Square Enix as a developer. And not only that, for a return of Tobol as well. They announced what would be known as Tobol number... M? Wait a minute. That's not a number. That's not a number at all. Tobol M was a mobile game, and not exactly what fans were hoping for. From the few reviewers that had a chance to play it, it was an impressive PlayStation-style visuals out of cell phones in 2007, which was pretty par for the course with Dream Factory at this point. But again, average reviews, poor sales, no ports, and no release outside of Japan. This would effectively been the last Tobol game, and just to add insult to injury due to poor efforts of preservations of mobile games at the time, Tobol M is practically lost to the ether. The last major project Dream Factory would work on is taking the Battle Arena Toshin license, one that was long abandoned by Tamsoft, and attempting to reboot it for the Wii with Toshiden in 2009. And I know what everyone's first concern would be on a fighting game with the Wii, but no, there's no waggle whatsoever. Thank goodness. Instead, it utilizes the Wii's lack of buttons to create a deep fighting game experience by focusing on simplicity and a limited selection of moves. In a way, it's less of a sequel to Battle Arena Toshiden. I mean, it doesn't even use any of the original characters. Instead, it's more like a spiritual successor to Evil Zone, though it doesn't have nearly as much charm as that game. It features a mechanic to use your special meter to change forms, and a combo unlocking system where you use points to add and build combos to each character. It looked good and ran well on what was an underpowered console at the time, and it was a solid and creative fighting game. And yep, you guessed it, average reviews, poor sales, no release outside of Japan. Toshiden would be the last time there would be any sort of discussion about Dream Factory. After that, the company would go dark. Even the budget license games that they were working on to keep them afloat would stop. There was no official announcement of disbanding the company, no bankruptcy, no other studio or company buying them. They had just faded into the background, completely forgotten. It's difficult to say what happened to Dream Factory. Their website still exists and still has Seichi Ishii as the lead, but considering that the webpage still recommends using Netscape Navigator, it's pretty easy to assume it's not quite up to date. There had been some assumptions that Seichi Ishii had started another game development studio called Cattle Call, his name appearing in the credits of games such as Innocent Life, A Futuristic Harvest Moon, and a few games in the Ark the Lad series. But considering that these series had no connection with Seiichi or Dream Factory, some even predating his work with Sega, it seems like this was just another developer who shared the same name. It seemed like Dream Factory was no more. Which was a shame because here was a company that had all the potential in the world. 
It was founded by the man who was responsible for leading the charge in not just one, but two of the most pivotal moments that defined the fifth generation of consoles. The man who was responsible for spearheading the biggest evolution in the fighting game genre. This is a company that was renowned for being capable of pushing the hardware to its limits. One that had worked with some of the biggest names in gaming, such as Sega, Namco, Square, Microsoft, and Capcom. A company that, despite their lack of critical praise, nearly every original title they worked on could be considered a cult classic. A company that always kept trying to innovate and try new things, and never really followed a trend. A company that, for some reason or another, whether it was a result of their own design philosophy, bad marketing, poor circumstances, or simply bad luck, never managed to be a prominent success. A company that, despite everything else that could be attributed to it, might only be known in history as the people who made that fighting game that came with the Final Fantasy VII demo. However, that wasn't the end of Dream Factory or Saichi Ishii. In 2017, Dream Factory would once again rise from the ashes. Their name would be attached to two licensed Namco titles, though still neither of these were Tekken. Their first game was called Pac-Man Note, a Pac-Man themed puzzle game which took place predominantly on a notepad. More notably, Dream Factory would also develop a remake of Xevious. Both of these games were available for iOS and Android phones in Japan as part of Namco's catalog IP project. It was an incentive that the publisher would spearhead where they allowed any indie developer to use Namco's unused intellectual property and Dream Factory was one of the many companies that took advantage of it. And while I can't speak for Pac-Man Note because I couldn't get to run, the remake of Gazevious looks great and plays well, as expected for a Dream Factory game. It was unfortunately never released in the West and was taken off app stores in March of 2020. But thanks to preservation efforts, you can at least find an APK out there if you wish to experience it for yourself. But what these games offer is the biggest clue to what happened to Dream Factory after their nine year disappearance. In an interview with Famitsu, we discovered that these games were designed, programmed, and developed by Saichi Ishii. Only Saichi Ishii. The staff of Dream Factory after all this time is now down just to the founder. The rest of the staff of Dream Factory most likely moving on to other companies. Depending on your outlook, that might seem disheartening. Whereas Yu Suzuki gets most of the credit for bringing Sega into the 3D era, the person who is largely responsible for it seemed to be forgotten making mobile games. But Ishii doesn't see it that way. Having met his former co-workers when Sega was celebrating Virtual Fighter's 20th anniversary, he spent time reminiscing about the early days of his development in his past projects, not living with any regrets, having never stopped making games. I often relive the feeling of when I came up with the prototype of Virtual Fighter. I'm still creating games every day, challenging myself by seeing just how much I can make a game by myself. I want to make the most of what I can do with my own power. He added, enthusiastically, I look forward to all of you being able to see my work again. It's hard to say if we'll ever see another game from Dream Factory. If we do, it's likely it won't ever be another Tobol, Air Guys, The Bouncer, or on the scale of any of the other games that the company was responsible for. And let's face it, there's a chance it wouldn't come to the West even if it was. But Saichi Ishii's legacy reminds us it's not about fame or success. It's about the journey and the effort you put forth into it. It's not about fortune, but instead the wealth of memories and experiences you gain. That gaining experience builds character. And that as long as you keep working on achieving your dreams, those dreams will never die. I want to thank you so very much for watching. Being completely honest, when I started this video, I had no idea the history would be this deep. I sincerely thought I'd be talking about the Forsaken Dungeon for most of it, and you know what, that would have been fine. But this just goes to show that everyone has a story.
It's admittedly probably not the best use of time to spend two months making a 15 minute long video on a company that only a handful of people remember. I mean, the YouTube algorithm hates me already, but it was a story that I felt needed to be told. Which is why I am so incredibly grateful to those who support the channel. They are what allow me to work on these big expansive projects like these, and I am so appreciative all of their support. From those who support my Patreon, throw me a coffee, subscribe on YouTube, check out my humble partner link, share my things on Reddit and Twitter, or following me hoping that one day I stream on Twitch. Regardless of how they do it, I'm still incredibly appreciative. If you'd like to join them, you can find the ways to support the channel in the description below, or if you have some free time to kill, check out either one of these videos here. Now if you excuse me, I'm gonna go play some more Crimson Tears. This is Soberdorf reminding you that Black Lives Matter.